I'm Martin Tyler, and you're listening to Harry Simeon. Welcome back along to the Chronicles of Aguna. A week today, UEFA Champions League football returns to the carpet for the first time since the 2016-17 season. The Gunners' return to Europe's premier competition is long overdue. They've been drawn in Group B alongside the kings of the Europa League, Sevilla, Dutch giants, PSV Eindhoven, and of course, last season's Ligue 1 runners-up, Lons. And joining me on this very special edition of the show to preview this fascinating group and discuss his latest book, his European football expert, friend and all-round great guy, Andy Brassel. Andy, welcome. How are you? Yeah, good. Thanks for having me, Harry. No, thank you for doing this. I, I really, really do appreciate it. Um, whenever I think of European football, your name comes to my head first and foremost. You're like an <laughs> encyclopedia of European football knowledge. I'm always shocked by a how much football you're, you're able to watch over the course of a weekend and, and b how you yeah. remember all the information the way you do it is amazing i forget milk quite a lot like having said that so. <laughs> yeah. swings and roundabouts in it happens. yeah it happens it happens exactly um andy i wanted to start off though by talking about your latest book um which is a, a really great read uh, we play on Shakhtar Donetsk's fight for Ukraine football and freedom. We'll get into the content in just a moment, but I'm really kind of interested in how this book came about. What want, what made you want to write this specific book? Um, well, I, I guess I've been like covering Shakhtar on and off as, as part of my travels for like 15 years, maybe, maybe more. Um, what really... Um, got me into the the story even more so. I mean, they were always an eye catching watch under Michel Luchescu. They played football in a very particular way. I think everyone has their first Shakhtar experience where they go and see them. And they're like, "Well, okay, wow." Um, certainly back then. And um, then I, I did a film uh, about them for the Guardian in I guess that would be 2015 um, when they'd about a year after they'd moved out of Donetsk um, when fighting started there. Um, because if you ask anyone connected with Shakhtar, okay, the, the war in Ukraine, the full-scale war in Ukraine started in 2022, but um, war in Donbass started in, in, in 2014. It's been going on for a long time, and they've been essentially homeless since then. So um, I, I did a film out there. Um, the club were really open, uh, interesting and interested. And um, a couple of years after that, probably a couple of years after that, I got asked to... If, if I'd write a book off the back of that film, it wasn't really the right time, didn't really uh, work out. Um, but then, obviously, with the escalation of everything happening, uh, not only was there the opportunity to write it, it, it felt like something incredibly important to, to, to write. So it was it was the right moment to do it. And again, the club were really open and honest and approachable in, in a way that, Football clubs generally aren't, you know, they're, they're quite protective of their, their, their public image, whereas I, I just had an incredible amount of access for this. So um, they really got under the skin of the club. It's interesting you mentioned that obviously Shakhtar were displaced uh, way back in 2014. Have you found that in sort of going around and talking about this book that a lot of people didn't actually realise that and didn't actually realise how long the issues had been going on in that particular region? Yeah, uh, I, I think so. Uh, you, you hear it um, described as like skirmishes, um, low-level conflicts, all, all sort of stuff like that. Um, but, you know, this was something that made these people have to leave their homes, uh, leave their lives and, and, and go and live in another part of the country. So um, it was something that was a, a, immense for them. And uh, yeah, I think because they managed to keep things going, like relatively normally because um, they managed to keep a lot of their players and um, keep going in the Champions League. Um, obviously, since they've moved out of Donetsk, they've won um, five league championships. They've won um, four Ukrainian Cups, got to two Euro semi-finals um, in, in the Europa League. I think it can make people from the outside feel like everything's normal. And it was, it was never normal. You know, they were for a long time, living in a hotel um, owned by the, the, the club owner, Rina Akhmatov. And um, it's a very unsettling, difficult way to to live any sort of life, even even a footballer's life. So, yeah, I, I, I guess um, 
filling in some of the blanks for people who are un unaware of that is probably quite helpful. The foreword is, of course, written by uh, Dario Cerna. Everybody's familiar with Dario Cerna, legendary player. Um, how engaged were you with him? And, and obviously, you mentioned that the club were really open and uh, and really sort of forthcoming in terms of giving you access. How helpful was it to speak to someone that's actually a, a proper part of it? You know, you can speak to club staff, but mm. Dario Cerna understands it on and off the pitch. So he would have been a great person, I'm sure. To, yeah, you're uh, absolutely with. You're absolutely right, Harry. He, he understands it on, on every level as well um, because um, he's been player, assistant coach, now sporting director at Shakhtar for uh, over, over a period of, of, of 20 years, just with one year away at, at, at Cagliari, um, just at the end of his, his, his playing career. So he, he lives and breathes Shakhtar. Uh, he understands the club totally. And uh, on, on every level, on a management level, a playing level, he, he knows what most people at the club are going through at any time. And of course, unfortunately, he went through war in the former Yugoslavia when he was a kid. So, um, you know, he always, he always says to me, I've, I've, I've been through like, three wars in, in, in my life. You know, I've had to move because of war three times in my life. Once when he was like seven, eight years old, um, back in, in, in the former Yugoslavia in Croatia. Um, then when Shakhtar had to leave Donbass and, and, and then again from, from, from Kiev. So um, it's, it's a lot. It's, it's a lot to have to deal with. But, um, you know, he's, he's still got the same energy, same enthusiasm, um, same desire to keep Shakhtar going on that level. And, you know, he's, he's someone who's, as a player, especially was used to winning all the time. So, you know, for, for him... That, that is that is still a given. That is still a, a really important thing, you know. And um, to have so many of, of of those sort of people around the club, you know, you look at the senior management of the club. Most of them have been there like 15, 20 years. You know, they're they're all very closely bonded together. So it's it's kind of unique in in, in that way. I suppose it's not quite the same. But when um, people used to talk about the, the the Anfield boot room, that sort of sense of of continuity that's really important any any football club they've got that to to the nth degree and you know he's, he's he's a great leader as well as a great personality when you started writing this book I, I can imagine that when you start off writing a book I've not done anything like this but you've looked at it and gone this is going to be an exciting project but there must have been moments along the way where you felt sadness because of the story that you're obviously telling so how how were the kind of emotions were it sort of up and down along uh, along the way yeah, a little, I guess. I mean, I think you just feel a sense of responsibility, really, that you're telling a story that's really important and you're telling a story that's... You're telling a lot of people's personal stories, really. Um, that, that's that's something that, that, that you're aware of all, all the time. But, I, I mean, a bit where you're hearing some people's, in some cases, very harrowing stories. Yeah, of course, it's... It, it, it's something that doesn't feel great when when you when you're hearing this because you know people have gone through unimaginable suffering, but you've only had to hear it. They've actually had to go through it. So I think all the time, it's it's, it's a different level of satisfaction, really, because um, we all love football. Um, we all love talking about it with enthusiasm and context um social and political context as, as, as well in, in in many cases um but 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 this is this is something different because what Shakhtar have developed into is beyond the football club you know there are there are a, a social beacon who help people who've um, been injured in the war who've been orphaned who've been cut off in their communities and don't have access to to work and sometimes food and, and that goes all the way back to, to, to 2014 when um, Donbass basically economically crumbled when um, um, the Russians moved in and a lot of people who could moved out. So I, th I think you do feel the importance of that all the time. So I, I guess you would say satisfaction rather than enjoyment. So that's why it's, 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 it's slightly different. But yeah, I think the feeling... When you get to the end, I've never had the feeling of getting to the end of a project like this one where you, you feel, yeah, I was able to you know, do this some justice. Brilliant stuff. Andy, uh, when's it out? Where can people find it? Let everybody know. Um, September 28th is uh, the publication date. And um, yeah, it'll be available digitally and all that 
sort of stuff as well. We we play on, and um, yeah, I would no, normally I, I I tend to think if 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 I've done a piece of work, listen to it, read it. If you want to, don't. If you don't, but I, I genuinely think um, whatever your interest in in, in, in football in, in in this part of the world or not, it's it's it's, it's worth it. Some people have got some incredible stories in it. Brilliant stuff. Andy, looking forward uh, to getting into it in a lot more detail. Right, we're going to take a short pause and then we're going to look at Arsenal's UEFA Champions League group because it all kicks off in a week's time. Welcome back to the show. I'm joined by Andy Brassel, European football expert. Um, Make sure you check out his uh, brand new book, which is coming out a little bit later on this month. We play on. Um, We'll leave the link uh, for you to order it as well, of course, in the description. Um, Andy, before we do a bit on each of the teams that Arsenal will face in this group individually, what would you say to those who have labelled Group B as a group with a bit of a Europa League feel to it? (laughs) <laughs> I can understand where they're coming from and if it is going to be uh, one of those teams that have particularly got uh, currency in the Europa League this is their last possible year to do it of course in uh, the, from the Champions League you know this is the last possible year where um, you can finish third and, and go into a Europa League group so um, it'd be interesting to see if Sevilla managed to do that I, I'm, I'm not sure they will given um, the other teams in the group. Look, I think if, if you're Arsenal and you've been out of the the, the Champions League for a while, the, the, these are teams that have all done something in, the, in this competition before. Obviously, with Lance, it's best part of two decades really since they've they've really made a dent in this this, this competition. You know, you go back what 15 years and their Felix Boller Stadium is, is is housing Lille in this this competition. But you know. PSV are previous winners, so like the fact that the landscape and especially the financial landscape of European football has changed, I don't think that's entirely their their fault. But if, if I was an Arsenal fan, I'd be massively looking forward to this, especially as Arsenal are absolutely favourites from the group. So I think if you look at this, it's not about taking it easy or anything like that. If Arsenal approach this in, a, in an applied manner, they're, they're going to win the group and. Then obviously everything is, is 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 possible going forward because you know you look at the the depth that Arsenal have. I think I think they're well set for this challenge. So the pressure's on then, basically. <laughs> let's uh, one way put it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, let's run through the teams and let's start with uh, Sevilla. Of course, they're the top seeds in the group, being the Europa. Mm-hmm. Uh, league kings what can we expect from them um, you'll know a lot more about them than I do that's why you're here but um, they, they did apply a sort of pragmatic approach didn't they um, towards the back end of last season lots of talk about the coach's style and all the rest of it mm. what can Arsenal expect for them from them as an opponent uh, going into the two games they're going to play well of course from the Europa League final which I imagine a, a lot of your viewers sort of watch from um, behind closed fingers or the back of the sofa. It was, so much was made of how much that meant to Roma, uh, that, that, that they needed it more um, because uh, they had had um, a season where they, they desperately made, needed to make the Champions League, having been um, fettered a bit by FFP. And yeah, it's clearly made a difference there summer. Um, but with the fine margins and the penalty shootout going in the way of Sevilla, I think it's worth underlining that they needed it as well. They're in a terrible financial state at the moment. Um, they've had a couple of, well, a, a year and a half that's been really bad. Um, got through a couple of coaches. Um, and I, I think... It'll be interesting, depending on where Sevilla go in the next um, year or two, looking back on the back end of Monchi's tenure now. Now, of course, he's at Aston Villa. Keen to see how he gets on there. Um, His previous appointment as a sporting director at Roma um, didn't go brilliantly. He signed Nicola Taniolo and it was pretty much downhill all all, all from there. And he's um, not particularly loved. Um, at the Capital Club now but I I think you look at his dealings in the last two years of his his, his time at Sevilla 
and they've been on a sporting level quite disastrous and financially as, as as well. They've ended up with a wage bill bigger than they wanted, and Victor Orsa, who obviously people have views about from his his, his time at Leeds, was left with the unenviable task of, of cutting, cutting, cutting that wage bill in, in in the last week and a half before the end of the transfer window. So. They've, they've got an older squad than they want as well. There's not a massive amount of saleable assets there. When you look at them at the start of last season, of course, the season before last, they're in position like halfway through the season to have a proper go at, at, at winning La Liga. Um, they brought in Anthony Martial on a loan, which didn't work out and proved a huge money drain for them. Didn't work for him, didn't work for the club. But I think... That was symptomatic of, of, of where they went. They, they, they tried to get in that bit more experience. And then they ended up with a, a sort of situation last season where they were, um, that they, they had really a, a young defence and an old forward line. And really, you want the other way round, don't you? You want your experience at the back and you want the legs going forward. And so they were in a real state. I mean, three months off the end of last season, they, they, they could have easily been relegated. Now, uh, Jose Luis Mendilia came in, did a, a really good job, explained as sort of, you know, Spanish Sam Allardyce, what, what, whatever before. I, I yeah, mean, that's what I was referring to about the style. Yeah, yeah, you were, you were. And, um, you know, I, I think uh, he, he did brilliantly. And given that he had no European experience, to get them in the final of the Europa League and get them to go on and, and win it was was pretty incredible but a lot was made of Roma and Mourinho and the the way that um, they played in the final Sevilla love a scrap as well and certainly Mendelibar's Sevilla side love a scrap you know that they're they're not exactly Netherlands 1974 so um, I think you have to bear that in mind as 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 well Um, now I, I guess the thing is because they've chopped that wage bill further they're still a little bit in a state of flux. So you've, you've lost some big players, um, some ones that they were hoping to sell, actually, for financial reasons, like um, uh, Lucas Campos, uh, uh, Yusuf and Naziri have, have, have stayed, which is good for this Champions League campaign, although, yeah, they, they needed the cash. Um, they're not in great shape at the moment. They've had a really bad start to this season. Um, Bono is a, a, a big loss although they were sort of fa- phasing him out sort of in the back half of last season uh, Dimitrovic the, um, the the goalkeeper now was a, a big favourite of Mendelibar before that so um, I think that, that, that changeover is something that they've, they've managed quite capably um, but I think we look at Sevilla we look at um, European pedigree um, particularly in, in, in the Europa League this is not good to be a side by any stretch of the imagination. I think you look at some of those key players, uh, Ivan Rakitic, who actually had a decent run into last season, has looked past his best for most of the time that he's back there. And of course, so much hype about the re-signing of Sergio Ramos. But really, um, good as he still is, um, and it, obviously he's not peak Ramos, but he's, he's, he's still pretty good. I think there are two major issues with this. Firstly, is leaning into what Sevilla's whole problem has been in the last year and a half, two years in like signing old guys and um, expensive in many cases, old guys, although of course he's only earning one twentieth of what he could have earned in, in, in Saudi if he'd have signed for Al Ittihad. I think the other thing is used to being in teams that win. You know, how does it, how does it work out when he's playing for a team that has less of a ball, that has to defend deep, that's got to be a bit more patient, I, I think that's it's something very different for him. It's a great point. It is a great point. Um, let's take it on to PSV Eindhoven. Uh, of course, they overcame Rangers uh, in the qualification process for this tournament. They've started their league campaign pretty good. And actually, they beat Arsenal back in October last year in the Europa League, uh, a 2-0 victory uh, that day for them. Gakpo and Xavi Simmons were, were key in that match, but none mm-hmm. of them are, are at the club anymore. Uh, which is interesting. What do you make of PSV at the moment? And are, are they a threat if Sevilla aren't uh, to ask the win it's in case of going to the top spot? Well, I, I think that the, the point about those departures, I mean, it's, it's, it's Dutch football in a nutshell, isn't it? You know, when you lose players who are absolutely top quality, there's no way you can replace them with players of 
equivalent quality, even if you've got an incredible history in, in European football like PSV have. Xavi Simons is the one, really. Um, you know, best player in the Netherlands last season. Looks like he's probably on the way to becoming the best player in, in Germany this season. And really, I don't exaggerate. He's been brilliant for Leipzig in the, the opening weeks of, of, of this season. I guess you have to look on what that... And, of, of course, Ibrahim Sangare going to Nottingham Forest, which is, again, like totally irreplaceable. It looked like they were going to hold on to him for most of the window. And um, then, you know, one of the most promising midfielders in Europe goes. No, I, I think it'll be a, a huge plus for, for, for Nottingham Forest. But the good thing for them is they did manage to hold on to Johan Bakayoko, who Brentford really wanted. Brentford offered big money for, by the way, just as they did with uh, Nico Gonzalez at, at Fiorentina. And uh, he, he's, he's terrific. I think you look at the increasing click between him and uh, Lukaku in the, in the Belgian national team. Um, to, to say he's a left-footed winger who cuts in from the right doesn't really do him justice. There's a little bit more than that. Um good change of pace, picks a pass really well um, and having big lummocks like uh, Luke de Jong to aim for in the middle uh, really helps as, as, as well. So I think it's an interesting season for PSV because Feyenoord have lost a couple of players, and the defending champions, although they still have Arne Schlott, the coach. Um, Ajax are all over the place at the moment, like really all over the place. I, I wouldn't be betting a pound of your money on them winning the league this season. I, I think PSV know they've got an opportunity. I think what is the biggest impediment, apart from losing three very talented players, obviously, to them doing well in this group, is the fact that Peter Bosch is a coach. Now, he is a coach who, when he everything clicks with him and his teams play well, they're great to watch. Uh, they're very exciting. I think you go back to that uh, Ajax side that got back to the Europa League final, um, going go back, what, five years? And they lost to United in the final. Um, that, they were really good to watch, really good to watch. And um, obviously, Eric Ten Hag took them on from there and they, they went on and went bigger and better. But um, there's this quote from Peter Bosch when he was in charge of Dortmund for a short and not massively successful spell that always sticks with me. Um, he was asked in a press conference once, uh, did he have a plan B? And he said, there's no plan B. You just do plan A better. And you're like, oh, yeah, okay. That's, that's a really interesting way of looking at things. And that separates, I think, elite coaches from pretty good coaches. You, you do need that that second way of, of, of doing things. You need, a, you need a backup. You need to be versatile. And he's just really quite... Um, evangelical in, in the way that he wants to play and the way he does want to play is with a, a high line often quite easy to get especially with the with the players and the pace that Arsenal have got at the front of the team the way they can drive forward and counter attack I think the way that PSV are going to play is built for Arsenal to take them to bits well, we'll see if he has got but a plan B if he changes it don't worry I mean he, he, he doesn't <laughs> can he do plan A better that's the question that's the question absolutely um, let's touch on Lons as well uh, who are of course uh, the uh, the lowest ranked seed in the group um, but they had such an impressive campaign last season finished second to Paris Saint-Germain by just a point if I'm not mistaken yeah. Um, yeah. fair to say the start of this season though for them has failed to live up to expectations three defeats from four second from bottom what did you put that down to? What's happened there? Is it player departures? Is it that they were punching above their weight last season? How would you kind of summarise what they are today in comparison to what they were at the end of May? Well, it's a bit of both those things, Harry. I mean, they, they lost their two best players, Seko Fofana, the, the, the captain, a uh, really good midfielder who came close to going to the Premier League, actually, before he's very, very close to joining um, Burnley the season that they got relegated in winter. I mean, he probably would have kept them up. He's, he's, he's such an ins inspirational player. He's gone off to Saudi. And then you've got Lois Appender, who had a great season up front and they sold to Leipzig for a, a very decent fee in the end, nearly 50 million euros. Um, what has worked for them, though, is, funnily enough, Lucas Pakatar has got a hand in this because um, of his move to Manchester City falling through, West Ham didn't have the money to buy LUA the um, French under-21 striker, who's a, a real firecracker. Um, you know, he's, he's, he's pacey, he's intelligent, he's a good finisher, he makes things happen. Um, normally, 
Lars wouldn't be able to afford him and they wouldn't have had the opportunity to get him because the Premier League club would have taken him. But the Pakatar move falling through meant West Ham didn't immediately have the money to buy him. Lars, with their Champions League money and the money that they've received for Appenda, were able to come in, make a bid. And that he accepted that move when he was on for a, a, a Premier League move says everything you, that you need to know about Lars. That people in France look around and think, OK, they're serious. The thing about Lars is... You know, it's, it's a working class, traditionally coal mining town, um, not particularly exciting tourist destination, but, you know, the atmosphere in the stadium is remarkable. And it, it always has been, even, even when they were not doing well, you know, they were really struggling with bad owners in the second tier for, for quite a long time. You know, they've only just come back up what four or five years ago. Um, but what they've done under Franquez, the, the coach has, has, has been remarkable. Now, their sporting director, Florent Gizofi, went off to um, Nice last season. He's mostly responsible for building his team. There are lots of other good players in there. You, you, you look at Machado at left back. Uh, you look at Facundo Medina. They've got Bree Samba in goal now as, as, as well since he left Nottingham Forest. And he, he's been great there. He's got himself into the French squad. Um, but what they've done is is gone for that continuity. Um, so once Gizolfi went, they just get, gave as the, the the coach, sort of general manager responsibility, which is always a little bit risky, I think, in in today's game. Um, we're going to find out really because moving on from two such big players in Appender and particularly for Fana, is is going to be tough. But Way is a terrific signing. I think there'll be a handful for anyone at home. So I think even though Sevilla and PSV have got the biggest names, I, w- I wonder if, if, if Lance might do it. Now, it's always difficult finding that balance. When you're a club that qualifies for the Champions League that's not really expecting it or that's not really got any history, recent history in it, or that's not used to it, always reminds me of, you know, when the year that Arsenal should have won it in, in, in 2004. And, Don't remind um, me. Don't remind me. Yeah we'll, yeah, we'll move on from that bit. <laughs> I, I was, I was going to talk about... Um, beating Celta in the, in, the, in the last 16, which was a pretty good game, particularly the first leg in Galicia was was, was really good. That, that had a decent team at the time. And they put so much into that Champions League campaign, they ended up getting relegated at the end of the season. Now, I'm not saying that could happen to Lance, despite the fact they've got one point for four games so far. Like I said, it'll bed down why he will get in the team and be properly fit and they played PSG in those first four games. And they were they, they were quite good as well, even though PSG were really really excellent that day. Yeah. Um, but I think for a club like them, at least Sevilla and PSV, they're used to balancing a league campaign and a European campaign. That's not really the case for Lance. So it is a massive leap for them, especially to have to do it at Champions League intensity. Yeah, for sure. Um, Andy, before I let you go, um, fantastic insight on all the clubs that Arsenal are coming up against. In Group B of this season's UEFA Champions League, if you could choose one away trip as an Arsenal fan, as a football fan, to go to out of these games, you can go to Seville, you can go to Eindhoven, or you can go to Lons. Which one are you picking? Give the fans some advice. Well, obviously, I want to be super greedy and go for all three. <laughs> but um, I think with Lance, as I was saying, it's not a particularly exciting town, but, but but the atmosphere is brilliant. You could stay in Lille, which is 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 just next door. You can get the Euro starter there, so nice, easy little uh, train trip. And um, the selection of beers in in Lille is, is is brilliant. It's close enough to Belgium for it to be very very good. Um, Seville's like maybe my favourite city on earth. So from a personal view, I'd probably go for uh, Sevilla. Uh, you, you'll get you get decent weather as as well, despite the fact that um, we're heading into autumn now because it's it's a hot place and the food there's terrific. And the bit where they sing the anthem there, oh, it's hairs on the back of the neck going up kind of stuff. There you go. I think that's the one that I'm going to do as well. So um, I'm glad you've said that. You might have swayed me yeah, go on. Uh, on that one. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, Andy, thank you so, so much uh, for joining me. Really, really appreciate it. Uh, just remind Pleasure. people where they can find your work, um, when and where they can find the book as well, uh, which is due to be released uh, a little bit later on this month. Just uh, plug away. 
uh, so, sorry, is, is at Andy Brassel on uh, Twitter, at Andy Brassel 11 on Instagram. Um, you will see me um, plug in uh, my Monday Bundesliga column in The Guardian, all, all various other radio shows, uh, the Football Ramble podcast, uh, which I'm on a couple of times every week, and on the continent, our European show, which is on its um, own feed uh, this year um, at otc.pod. At OTC Pod, <laughs> right. it's, it's a new feed. I'm sorry, uh, and um, yeah, you can uh, follow us with uh, two uh, shows worth of European football every week. You get the main show and Ask OTC, where we answer all your questions. Um, and yeah, we play on out on September 28th. If you want to read that, amazing. I'll leave the link to order that in the description. Thank you. Andy, thank you so much. Thank you to everybody for tuning in. We'll be back very, very soon with more. One week to go until Arsenal return to the Champions League. Can't wait. I'm Martin Tyler, and you're listening to Harry Simeon.